Thank you. Uh, so I feel really honored to introduce our next, pre next uh, presenter, Lisa Carey. She is a senior education consultant and a center for innovation and leadership in special education and Kennedy Krieger Institute and a cast culture member. So she serves as a bridge between researchers, clinicians, and educators translating advances in the cognitive sciences to actionable practices within the classroom. Lisa is currently a doctoral student in instructional technology at Townsend University, where she is focused on the improvement of pre-service and in-service training and supports for teachers. Let's welcome Lisa. Hi, guys. Thank you. So I'm officially having the nerdiest day ever. I just talked about Harry Potter. Now I'm talking about brains. And I don't know which one I like more. Um, actually, it's brains. I don't know what I'm talking about. So um, as you said, I work at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, I worked for a year with our neuropsychology and neurology departments, um, which are affiliated with Johns Hopkins, to learn about the, how the brain learns and operates and how does the brain develop to better understand education. Um, so I occasionally start talking about brains and I wind up with people saying, well, I, I don't feel like I can learn about this. So I want to be really clear that my background is in history. Um, that I was a history major. I actually started off as a psychology major. The professor came in, put down a tub with a brain in it on the front desk. I was like, that's disgusting, I'm out. So it's ironic that I am now um, working with people that study brains, still won't touch them though. Um, so anyone can learn this information. The reason why educators have had trouble learning about this is that it's not part of our teacher training currently, which I'm trying to, to like change. Um, and it's not usually part of our ongoing professional development and we're not really good at communicating with the researchers and the clinicians that are working on this and they're not great at communicating with us either. There's some barriers. Um, so we are trying to solve those problems at Kennedy Krieger, but I'm always very excited to talk to teachers and to just remind you that there, with the growth mindset piece, we can all learn this information and use it, and we're all in the business of cognitive development, right? If you're an educator, which I'm sure everyone in this room is, you're in the business of cognitive development. If you're a parent, a teacher, if you teach teachers, we're all in this business. And so we should probably learn what we can about the brain, but then really focus on what can we actually translate into practice for us. So there is some information I'm going to give you today that's some background knowledge, but some of it isn't something you can actually act on. It's just to understand it better. And then we're going to talk about things that we can actually act on. And then there's my prerequisite. I have two dogs and a husband slide right there. So we have some goals today, and just like our UDL goals, I made them student-centered, so we have I statements. So the first thing is that we're all going to talk about how neurodevelopment influences students' executive function skills. We're going to discover what causes executive dysfunction, and we're going to identify actions to take in the classroom. So whether or not you're actually in the classroom or you're supporting people in the classroom, my goal is for you to walk away with information that you can actually use. So those are my goals that I put together when I proposed this session. But you guys all came here with your own goals, I'm sure. Maybe some of it was just because you're like, I want to see the Harry Potter girl. Maybe she'll talk about Harry Potter some more. Maybe you're like, I like brains. Who knows? So I want you for a moment to just think, what do you want to know about neurodevelopment and executive function? Why have you come to this session? And then how can I help you dive deeper into this topic? And then I want you to just chat with the people around you, if you care to. You don't have to talk to your neighbor. Um, and just share with them why you think you're here and what you, what you want to get out of this. And then I want you guys to share with me what you want to get out of this so that we can kind of be flexible and address your needs as learners.
Okay, and I'm going to start bringing us back. Oh, you guys are really good. Usually I have to be like, all eyes on me. Okay, so if you feel comfortable sharing with the group, um, you can raise your hand and we'll share out. But also, I just want to say that you can also tweet this. And just to help, it, help us follow it a little bit better, you still use the IRN hashtag, but you can use this additional hashtag so that we all know we're talking about the same thing. So it's a hashtag like within a hashtag. So it's Shaping Brains, which is the name of this session. Um, and then my Twitter handle is Equitable Access if you want to private message me um, because you don't want to share with everybody else. Um, or you can just directly message me on Twitter. It's up to you. You can also use Post-it notes, um, which we have a lot of, and I can start to hand them out. Um, and there's a little like old school parking lot in the back where you can just tag those on later. If anyone wants some Post-it notes, you guys can kind of pass them back to anybody else, and I'll put some on this side. There you go. Get some for you guys in the front. All right, you can pass those. Yeah, sure. All right, so who wants to share why they're here? I guess I want to learn more about the impact of new technologies on the brain, how they reshape the brain, because I know that's a big discussion, not only with uh, teachers, but with parents, and what we can do to kind of support or um, mitigate, in some cases, the impact of those uh, of technology on, on the brain. That's a, great, that's a really great question. We can talk about that. Anyone else want to share? I want to be secretive in our, OK. All right, so once again, you can tweet questions, you can private message me on Twitter, or you can put those post-it notes. Um, if you want to email me, because you don't like Twitter, my email address is right here. So you can also email me during this session, or afterwards. And I'll come back to that. Okay. So the first part is just going to be, what is executive function? So who here feels like they know what that is? We know that it's in the, the framework. Um, Joni and I, if you guys, you remember Joni from yesterday, we were joking like, it's in the framework, so we're good. And I'll just drop the mic and we'll walk away. Um, <laughs> so, and yes, there was a Harry Potter picture in here. Um, so executive function is this umbrella term for all these different skill sets that we have to have to navigate goal-oriented behavior, which sounds very fancy, but it is just purposefully engaging in an activity to meet a goal. And when we say goal, because we're educators, we're like, our goal will be to write this five paragraph essay or to become president. Um, when neuropsychologists are writing about this and they say goal, they mean I wanna get the cookie over there, or I wanna get that girl's attention, or I just want to get to the bathroom and I want my teacher to let me leave. So anything that you are purposefully doing that is not automatic. So how many of you have ever driven somewhere and then not remembered how you got there, but you got there okay? Um, we do lots of stuff like that. Like you, you've navigated your house so many times that you don't even remember going room to room to room. It's just your habit. So you're not using executive function when you're doing that. But if you are driving or you're trying to navigate on the subway or something like that, and there is a barrier, so a roadblock, a traffic accident, your train is delayed, that is when you have to turn your executive function on. So you've got to think flexibly and think about how am I going to get around this barrier? What do I need to do? Maybe you're mentally pulling up maps in your head. If you're me, you're now panicking because you can't mentally pull up maps in your head and you're hoping your phone is charged. Um, but we come up with all these different solutions and we navigate around it. So that's when we're using executive function. So for high school students, for the most part, we're assuming that math facts for them is automatic and no longer executive function skills, but it's not for all of them. For younger kids, we can pretty much assume that most of them aren't automatic yet and they have to use executive function skills. So executive function skills are gonna change given the context and development. We're gonna keep coming back to that. So why should we care? Why is it in the framework to begin with? Um, we have tons and tons of research showing that executive function is a bigger predictor of academic outcomes than IQ. So if we hold all these other things the same, demographics, all these different things, how strong a student's 
executive function skills are will dictate how well they do. And that's because executive function is kind of like the, the way that we're able to show what we know. It's the competency. It's those skills that allow us to take our knowledge and actually do something with it. But what's more important about executive function and more exciting, I think, for us as educators is that it is developmental in nature and so it is influenced by the environment. And where is the environment that kids spend a lot of their time? In our classrooms. And so we have the ability to help shape their brains. So it's in the framework and it says provide options for executive functions. So we know students are highly variable, all of us are highly variable, and we wanna provide options for supporting executive functions, and we just talked a little bit about why. So we say you need to guide appropriate goal setting. Now that could be a big goal, or it could be a small goal. Support planning and strate strategy development, enhance capacity for monitoring progress. Now, if you go into the neuropsychology literature, which could be fun for you, maybe not, I don't know, but these are not necessarily the terms that are being used. This was translated into like teacher talk for people. Um, so when I go and look at stuff, people aren't necessarily using these phrases, and these are actually the higher level of the skills. So I wound up having to think about that pretty deeply, and we're gonna dive into that a little bit more. What does it mean when we, in the UDL framework, really talk about the higher level executive function skills, and what do we need to be there first? So now we're gonna talk about neurodevelopment because that's how we can get to that place, how we can understand that. So executive function comes from your genes, right? We all inherit, inherit our genes, and some of us have genetic coding for pretty good executive function. However, that hang, tends to hang out on this allele that's also matched up with a uh, tendency to be anxious. And anxiety is not good for your executive function skills, so it's kind of a wash. And then we have people who are, don't have the genetics for great EF, but they tend to be less anxious, and so that's a plus for them. And then we've got a mixed one. Um, and that's what's been found so far. But just know that there is a genetic component to that, right? But more importantly, our genetics are influenced by the environment and our brain neurology is influenced by the environment. So early caregiver experiences are extremely important, early education, and then we continue to either support executive function development or frustrate it. So how a student is growing up, what environment they're growing up in is really, really important. Um, the, what's really cool to find out about executive function is that the frontal lobe of the brain up here, this is the, the front, so we're looking at the top view. Um, it's the last part to develop in the brain. So if you're under 30 and you're in this room, you are a brain baby, it's still developing, and so the next time you forget to do something at work, just be like, brain baby, not my fault. Not fully myelinated in the front here. <laughs> um, so here's a little animation. In this animation, again, this is the top of the brain, this is the front up, up here, and then this is a side view, and it's going to change color so you can see it, it developing over time, and it, this is only from age four to 20. So hopefully, yeah, there we'll go. So you can see. Oh, I, you can't see that. That's, <laughs> is it going? All right, so what this animation is showing us is that the brain is developed, the change in color is demonstrating that the brain is going from the back. So if you take your hand and you put it on the, the back of your head, that's your occipital lobe, that's responsible for vision. And it is moving, the development is moving toward the front. So if you place your hand on your forehead and then you move your hand over your, your left eye, that's where your prefrontal cortex is. So that's the part that's developing last. And this animation is just one way of showing that. Um, now we talk a lot about brain development, but does anyone in this room actually know what we're talking about when we say that? Because we don't ever explain it, right? So here is a neuron, and we're about to get very biological, and this is not necessary to understand to support executive function, but I think it was fun to know about. This is a neuron. It is the cells that make up your brain. Your whole brain is made up of these things. This is the cell body that is the thinking part. 
This is the axon. This is where the message moves down. And then the message kind of like shoots out this way and jumps over to the next neuron. So when we are talking about um, brain development in kids under the age of 10, we are talking about increases in gray matter, which really just means they're making a lot of neurons. So their brain is, is physically growing, which makes sense if we think about that kids have small heads and then the heads get bigger, and the brains get bigger inside of them, right? So the gray matter is increasing till about age 10 for girls, age 11 for boys. Those are averages. Remember, everyone's variable, so we have outliers. Girls are more advanced than boys on average. We all knew that. <laughs> so that's up till middle school. How many of you have ever taught or currently teach middle schoolers or have a middle schooler at home? I'm going to tell you something that will make total sense to you now. At age 11, on average, the brain experiences something called programmed cell death. Yes. It's also called pruning, but programmed cell death is way cooler. So the brain then says, quality over quantity, let's get rid of the stuff we're not using. So maybe those Elmo songs, not necessary anymore. We'll just keep the ones we really like and the ones that we use more. So we, we say that what fires, what fires together wires together. So as we're using things, our brain is saying, oh, we use this a lot, let's keep it. But that other stuff, forget that. Um, so that's what middle schoolers' brains are doing, and now this all makes a lot of sense. Um, I told a bunch of middle schoolers that uh, two weeks ago for National Brain Week, and they were like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> so, um, so they understand that that's going on for themselves. After middle school, we then see increases in white matter. And what that means is that this piece that was shooting that message, it's getting coded in something called myelin or myelination. So when we talk about things getting myelinated, it's just insulation and it makes the neurons faster. So when we say that a 20 year old's brain is not fully developed, we're not saying they don't have neurons there. It's not missing, there's no hole. We're saying that they don't have that myelination. And so they might use their executive function skills, but they are not fast. They're not as fast as mine or yours probably, unless you're one of the people in this room under 30 and then sorry. So we're faster if you're older, slower if you're younger, but the neurons are there by age 10. So brains and skills develop together in a cycle. You cannot do something that you don't have the brain structure to allow you to do it, right? You need that. But you also won't necessarily develop and refine your brain unless you do the thing. So they have to go together all the time. So hold out your hand like this, and I want you to press each finger against your thumb one at a time, starting with your pointer finger and then moving down to your pinky and back. Okay, so you guys all have, for the most part, I think we've got pretty good fine motor skills. Fine motor skills are variable. Young children tend to not have very good fine motor skills because that part of their brain, which is in the frontal lobe, is not fully developed. If you have a student who cannot do that, they cannot hold a pencil. I don't care how many times you tell them to practice. I don't care if you try and give them a big chubby pencil. They cannot hold the pencil. Have them do something else. Or have them write on an iPad with their finger, right? Just all you have to do is like, can you do this? No? All right, here you go. We're going to do something different. You can show what you know in a different way. So remember we said that for our executive function skills at that higher level that UDL is talking about, so the goal setting, the planning, the strategy, the self-monitoring, those are those higher level things that all kids can do, but you have to have a foundational base of executive function skills first. So before we get there, we have this pyramid of skills that need to be in existence and they develop over time with brain and skill development working together. So we have a three-part pyramid here and at our base layer of the pyramid is inhibition control and then our second layer is working memory and our top layer is flexible thinking. Sometimes we think about flexible thinking as problem solving but I did a little bit of research and I asked people what they thought of when, they said, when I said problem solving and as teachers people said like math problems. So I didn't want anyone to get confused with that so I'm calling it flexible thinking which a lot of the literature still does. So those three things need to be in place before we move on to the other stuff. So let's talk about inhibition control. It is when you purposefully stop doing something before it happens or as after it happens, you kind of stop yourself. So it could be behavior or it could be emotion. So if you have kids that are very, very emotionally reactive, they're having poor inhibition control. 
Um, ADHD is primarily a disability that involves difficulty with inhibition control because of the neurology, right? It's not because they're just being like bad kids, it's because their brains are just not developed to that point. In fact, on average, kids with ADHD have brains that are about three years behind in development to their, their non-disabled peers. So you can in, have your inner thought bubble, you can control physical movements, you can stop and shift applications and rules. Now there's a few things that we can do to practice this skill and it's really good for you. So if you would like to participate, I would like you to stand up. You're gonna have to free your hands. You shake it out a little bit. You've been sitting a lot. We're gonna play Simon Says. Now I'm gonna activate your prior knowledge. It might have been a while. In Simon Says, when the leader, who is me, because I'm holding the microphone, says the phrase Simon says, you must follow the leader's, me, direction. If the leader, me, does not start her direction with the phrase Simon says, you must not follow the leader's directions. So this is a no go, no go activity, right? You have to keep inhibiting your behavior. So let's start off. Uh, Simon says, tap your shoulder. Simon, Simon says, tap your head. Simon says, stomp your foot. Simon says, touch your knee, touch your hip. Oh, some of you are out. <laughs> if you're out, you can sit or you can keep playing, that's fine. Uh, Simon says, stand on one leg. Simon says, stand on the other leg. Stand on no legs. <laughs> okay, Simon says, just stand. I actually did that with a group of teachers and some people were like, uh. <laughs> Uh, Simon says, put your hand in the air. Simon says, wave it around like you just don't care. Simon says, pretend you do have a hula hoop. Simon says, stand on one leg again. Switch legs. Oh, you guys are good. All right. All right, you guys can sit down. Oh, that was a good point. I did not say Simon says. You're the only winner. <laughs> Winning. All right. So that is a game that we play with young kids. But what researchers at Harvard Center on the Developing Child discovered was that it's actually really, really good for inhibition control development. And so when we talk about like taking brain breaks or taking movement breaks, that could totally be your movement break, but you're also purposely developing skills. So it's like when we hide vegetables and things for kids so that they'll eat them. Like, oh, this is pizza. It's covered in vegetables, but it's pizza. So you're like, oh, we're taking a break, but I'm, I'm you know, helping you practice skills. Um, you can do it with older kids, too. There's no reason why we can't do that. You guys really enjoyed that, right? You seemed like you were smiling. I'm going to pretend like you enjoyed that. So high school kids, I think, would be really into this. Middle school kids are too focused on trying to be cool and adults. So they'd probably hate you if you tried to make them do this. But there's other things that they can do that has that. Um, Tools of the Mind, which is the, um, one of the few curriculums that are designed and proven to enhance executive function, they do this and they play freeze dance with kids. Freeze dance is another option. And they actually have a freeze dance like next level up where they will have some kind of movement that you have to do when you're freezing. So not only do you have to freeze when the music stops, but it's like you have to freeze and like do this. Um, so like, put your hands in the air and um, that is helpful for kids to develop those skills. So our next one is working memory. And this is when you hold something in mind to manipulate it and you have like, a bunch of different information. Um, so for Simon Says, we use that a little bit because you guys had to remember what the rules were and remember when to inhibit. But really working memory develops a lot stronger after we develop inhibition control and we can hold things in mind. Um, we can hold about five different pieces of information in mind at once. Some people are better, some people are worse. It's all okay because we all have devices to help us now. And we all have strategies that we use like writing things down. Um, so we're going to try an activity that is shown to improve working memory. So this group that's before the door on this side, you guys are gonna be group one. In the back on this side, you guys are group two, and then you guys are gonna be group three. And how many people know the song, Row, Row, Row Your Boat? Do we need to activate anyone's prior knowledge and sing it for them? I am fine with that, we'll do that. No? Okay, so when we sing in rounds, we don't all sing at once. This group's gonna sing first, and then the next group. 
So you're going to say, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 and then you guys are going to jump in. Okay? Does anyone remember the point in which you're supposed to jump in if we sing this song in rounds? Right. Okay. So you guys are good? You feel confident. Thumbs up. We feel confident. All right. You guys? No pressure, but at Region 4 in Texas, they could have been professional choral. It was 400 people that I tried doing this with, and I was like, we'll see how this goes. And I was like, oh my God. We're going on tour. All right, so no pressure. All right, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> okay, we're not going on tour yet, but... <laughs> You guys tried. That was good. I feel like the second group really had it, and then you, it, we kind of like struggled. So what did you want to? Yes. Ah. Lo siento. All right. But I want to understand how working memory with all the things Yes. Right. So. What, hap what did you guys have to do in order to come in on time? So we have the first group. What did the second group have to do? You had to pay attention. You had to keep in mind when you started. And then you had to purposely focus your attention on what you were supposed to be singing instead of jumping in with them. And then this group had to do the same thing. So if we sang that in rounds several times, um, you guys would then have had to do that. And so you have to remember the rules, remember the lyrics, remember the harmony, and also purposefully not get distracted. Um, great question, thank you. So musical education is great for developing working memory. How many of you have studied music, dance? Do we have any theater people? A little box step? All right, all of those things are good. Um, lots of sports are good too. Um, but anything where you have to think about the rules, what I'm supposed to do, and pay attention to what's going on around you all at once is really good for working memory, but will also challenge working memory skills. So here's our last little simulation. Guys, gear up. This is a flexible thinking one. This one's harder, all right? So this one's where we decide if you guys are smarter than a fifth grader. So flexible thinking, you have to take multiple perspectives, you have to think about what the problem is, potential barriers. You have to work around them. Um, you have to manipulate things in mind, recognize patterns and problems, all these different higher level things. So here's your problem. We'll see what you guys come up with. You are locked in a room with a cyborg, which is also known as an artificial intelligence robot. Right? So you're with a cyborg and a hologram. You have two minutes before the room runs out of oxygen, which just to supply you with background knowledge, you kind of need to breathe. The cyborg has the key to get you out of the room, but in order to get, to get the key, you must guess which is the cyborg and which is the hologram, and you can only ask one question. Yes? A hologram is a projection of an image, but it can look very, very real, so you can't tell which one's the projected image and which one is the robot. You can ask one question, and you only have two minutes, but for the purpose of here, we only have one minute. Our, our oxygen ran out a little faster. All right, so think about it, and then come up with a solution with your group, and we'll see what we come up with. Thirty seconds. <laughs> you have it? You guys look very confident. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, 
two, one. All right. What was your? He he said it. We just said, could, could we shake your hand? Yeah. Oh, why are we shaking the hand? Well, the hologram wouldn't keep its, its form. Right. Well, but then I was thinking, you're asking, can I shake yeah. your hand? Yeah. No. Yes or no? Yeah, that's oh, awesome. multiple perspective. You have to do it. And I said, if he says no, throw something at him. Yeah. If he tries to catch it, <laughs> if he tries to catch it and can't, then we have a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Any other answer? You guys have the same idea? Anything else? Well, assuming they're going to tell the truth, which yeah. is an assumption, yeah. um, I would just say, do you have the key? Because one of them has the key. Yes. Yeah. But they have to tell the truth. I don't know. We don't know that. Do you have one? Along the shaking hands, um, we were just talking about like, can you go to the door and turn the knob because the hologram would go through it. But again, it's the it's the question when you ask a can you question, they can say yes or no, and they don't have to do it. So it's like if you that's the hardest part about this. Yes. Yes. But that's not a question. Who has the key? Ooh. Who has the key? All right. Anyone else? Okay, so a fifth grader came up with this scenario after schooling me in Harry Potter trivia for 10, like for like an hour, right? So there's a bunch of 10 year olds. I was hanging out with them because I was supervising them before their chorus concert. Um, they were asking me Harry Potter trivia. I was not citing the page number and so I was wrong. These were obviously some gifted nerdy kids. I felt I felt at home, but I was like also ashamed. So they were like, let's do something easier for you, Lisa. Let's skip the trivia because you clearly can't keep up with us. Um, and we're gonna go to some problem solving. And they came up with this scenario and I looked at them and I was like, I'd take off my shoe and I'd throw it at them. And they were like, oh! We didn't think of that. And I was like, that's because your frontal lobe is a 10-year-old frontal lobe. 33. All right. Um, so I just, just skipped the question part, right? But you guys had great stuff, like I'm going to shake your hand, or can I shake your hand, all these different things. Um, you guys were able to take perspective. You're like, oh, but maybe they don't have to tell the truth. Or, but if I ask that question, what might happen after I ask that question? These are things that are, are not super difficult for most adults to do, but are very, very difficult for younger kids. So I totally blew their minds, and I won back all my respect that I had lost in the Harry Potter trivia game. So it was very important to me. <laughs> um, but so scenarios like this can help us. They're like word problems and scenarios. This is why games um, where you have to do role playing can be really, really good for developing executive function skills. So all those kids playing Dungeons and Dragons, we should stop making nerd jokes. They're developing really, really important skills. Um, so these skills are also context dependent. Now I did something to you where I was like, you have two minutes, never mind, one. And then I did a countdown, which actually was only 20 seconds in. That was mean. Um, <laughs> So it's totally context dependent, and our bodies and brains actually have this thing called the zone of optimal performance. So we, call it, we talk about the zone of proximal development. This is the, the optimal performance piece. If our arousal, meaning like our interest, our, our emotional stuff is low, then we're like, well, there's not really like a reason for me to you know, work hard at this. If it's just right, we do really well. So like a little bit of anxiety, like um, Alison Posey talked about yesterday, a little bit of anxiety might help you on a math test too much and we've like gone over the deep edge. So this is me after hiking up um, some stuff at Canyonlands National Park last summer with my friend. Um, and then this is when we went to go back down and I saw how steep it was. In this photo, you can't see how steep it was. So I feel like this makes me look really lame, but it was very steep and scary. And so I laid down and gave up and she kindly took a picture of me and made fun of me on Facebook. Um, so I was completely competent in one part of this trip and then not so much and I got anxious and laid down. Um, and our students are the same way and all of these skills work together in that way. So. We've talked about neurodevelopment and executive function skills. Now we're gonna quickly talk about executive dysfunction. You are all familiar with executive dysfunction because you have seen students who have lost their cool, thrown a laptop, maybe, had a meltdown, couldn't remember any of the directions and then asked you a hundred times and then still couldn't remember because they were so busy asking you and following you around the room that they forgot what you said. Um, or just couldn't figure out that word problem 
or make inferences about what might happen next in a novel. So executive dysfunction is when your level of ability is not matching the context. Okay, so that could be because the demands were too high for your developmental level. So if we take a kindergartner who seems very competent in kindergarten and we put them in a fifth grade classroom, they're not going to look very competent, right? Um, so in addition to the context, we can also wind up with skills that are um, at a deficit for different reasons. So developmental and learning disabilities are associated with executive dysfunction. Um, a lack of caregiver and environmental support. So when we talked about those early developmental pieces, if those weren't in place for a variety of reasons, um, you might be a little behind in your executive function skills. You can totally catch up. This is something that is catch upable. Um, in fact, Head Start programs that have worked with tools of mine, that executive function curriculum I was talking about, they're pre-K kids that were coming from environments of to toxic stress and poverty and um, high violent areas. Those kids caught up to their peers. Um, and then overly demanding scenarios, like what I just talked about, throwing a kindergartner in a fifth grade classroom. Yes? Has the research said anything about um, an age at which you can't catch up, like where it's difficult? No. We have plastic brains, which just means they're flexible, and we can practice and we can develop skills. Um, now, we are highly variable, so the amount of skills that we individually can all, it's going to be very variable, but you can always develop new skills. There's no shutoff point. There are, so we, in the past, people have talked about critical periods. Um, there are no critical periods, there are sensitive periods. So it might be easier for you to pick up some skills when you're younger, but that does not mean you can't when you're older. So sensitive, not critical. All right, so going back to that diagram we had where we had the pyramid, where the base is inhibition control, and the middle is working memory, and the top is flexible thinking, and then it maps on to those higher level skills we talk about in UDL, those things can take a hit at any time, right? You could be in a scenario that's really, really supportive, and you could be rocking these higher level ones, but your environment and your teacher who's designing your environment needs to keep in mind that certain things are predictive of having trouble. So students with ADHD are gonna have trouble with inhibition control. We should probably plan ahead for them and then also plan ahead for the other kids that maybe came in that day and were, I had a fight on the school bus and I can't like in a, in, use in my inhibition control to deal with my emotions, right? That could be anyone. So if we design for everybody to have some extra inhibition supports, we'll be good. The next one is working memory, which learning disabilities are associated with working memory problems. So is sleep deprivation. So how many people got less than eight hours of sleep last night? So is dehydration, right? I'm actually really bad about remembering to drink water and then I'll get halfway through the day and be like, why can't I think? And I'll be like, I didn't drink any water today. Um, Flexible thinking, so autism spectrum disorder, that whole perspective taking, that's really difficult for many people with autism spectrum disorder. So we need to plan ahead and help them out with that. Anxiety will come crashing down on all of these things, and so will stress. And we all know that none of us, no matter how old, can live completely anxious-free, stress-free lives. Unless maybe you live in Disney World, but I don't know. So we talked about neurodevelopment. We talked about executive dysfunction, and now we're going to get to the juicy part, the part why you're all here. You were like, you bared with me through the neuron slide, but you're ready to go now. All right. So we're going to support and develop executive function skills. So we can support through scaffolding in our environment for those kids that we know from day to day, given the different contexts, are going to struggle. So we're going to give our scaffolding, but it's a neurodevelopmental thing. So we can totally develop this too. And we can plan activities that are going to help kids develop these. And this is that brain shaping part. Um, so we can explicitly reteach behavior expectations at the start of new activities, which will help kids keep that in mind. We can give cues and reminders for expectations. We can teach them calming strategies, but we can also cue them to use them. We can remove unnecessary inhibition demands. That is the number one thing I want you to walk away with. If I tell a student, I need you to sit in your seat and not move, and they have the urge to move, are they inhibiting their other behaviors or are they working on not moving? I don't care if you move in your seat because I need you to inhibit the behaviors that have to do with this lesson. 
So I need to, you don't have endless control over yourself, especially for younger kids. So I'm going to pick the things I need you to control and I'm gonna give you options to let you kind of let loose on the other stuff. So if I need to have bouncy balls for you to sit on or let you stand at a desk, that's not just flexible seating because that's cool and we do that in UDL, that's because inhibition control can only handle so much at, at once and some kids just need to move and I don't want them to focus on that. So we can play those no go, no go games that we played. Um, mindfulness practices, yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, those three things have a large and growing body of evidence that they support executive function skills, okay? So we can do that with our students. This is a sixth grade classroom in Baltimore City um, where a teacher I work with has yoga breaks with her students and they have really flourished this year in terms of remaining calm. I watched a fight break out between two students. Earlier in the school year, the kids would have all circled around and gotten out their cell phones and chanted, fight, fight, fight. And this time they were like, oh man, you guys need to calm down. We're gonna go move over here so that Miss B can take care of that situation. I was like, what just happened? These are sixth graders. Um, and then we can provide purposeful movement breaks. So here's some examples of just Triggering kids to remind, remember things like accountability talk, reminding people of volume, um, showing kids examples and non-examples of behavioral expectations. So again, inhibition control has a lot to do with those behaviors. Working memory, right? We can model first and then provide step-by-step -step directions. If I provide you with the step-by-step -step directions, you're gonna be like, so first I do this and I do this and then, and then what am I even trying to do at the end? So you show the end product and then you talk about the step-by-step -step directions so they have in mind what they're trying to accomplish, where they're trying to go, and that idea has something to attach to. Task lists and process charts, graphic organizers, word banks, and then reducing, again, reducing competing demands. Don't have them have to remember everything. Teach them to make their own graphic organizers. Um, music instruction, matching and sorting games, and physical games that have multiple movements and rules. Those will all support the development of those skills. So here's some examples. Uh, this teacher has a station in her room where any student can just get up and go get the organizer that they need. So it's posted on the wall and they can grab those physically. This isn't a classroom where there isn't ample technology. So they have a low tech version of this. There are other school systems where the kids all have laptops and so that's on their learning management system. So you just have to provide options and work with what you have. Um, math stations that remind kids of what all of those different symbols mean when they're encountering them. Um, and examples of what a solved problem looks like in the end. Um, and then some other little assistance pieces over here. And then I love this thing like a scientist part. So if the kids forget what those things are, they can go back to that and flip up the, the thing that says, what is a hypothesis? And it phrases it for them so they can remember how to do that. Um, and there's another solution station piece over here. So flexible thinking, which is the hardest one. I'm gonna say guiding questions, guiding questions, guiding questions. When we ask kids guiding questions, we are becoming the voice in their head. So well, what could you do to solve that problem? What haven't you considered? What might happen if you choose to do that? Um, and we can do that with language arts, we can do that with math, we can do that with science, we can do that with all these different subjects. Um, create troubleshooting task lists. So these are areas where you might get into trouble. I'm predicting them, here you go, go reference that. Uh, frequently asked question guides, ask a peer protocols. A lot of times peers can guide students through, through things, but you wanna train the peers to ask their, th each other those guiding questions. So guiding questions should be the language of learning in your classroom. And then reciprocal teaching strategies, which is an evidence-based practice um, in which you're asking guiding questions. So we can do logic and reasoning games, Suyuko and crossword puzzles. I don't really like crossword puzzles because I can't spell, but that might be your jam. Um, activities that require role playing or perspective taking, um, activities that require self-reflection and then peer or near peer tutoring. Near peer tutoring is when you have slightly older and younger students working together. So here we have some examples. This is a turn-in station. So we have four folders, kind of got it, almost a nope. And the students are putting in their work at the end. So they're self-assessing and then the teacher sees if their self-assessment matches up with her formative feedback. 
And then they have conversations about that. Like you keep putting it in the note pile, but you're getting 100% on all of these. Let's talk about why you think you're not getting it. Or you keep putting it in the got it pile and you don't yet. So let's have a conversation with that. Um, things like model Congress um, are really great for those perspective taking. Lego building. Um, this is a, an example of some near peer tutoring. Here we have a sixth grader who's working with some second graders. Um, this is a K through eight school in Baltimore where they have a peer buddy reading program. Um, and then over here we have um, students designing um, some um, mini golf courses for Artscape, which is the biggest outdoor arts festival in the country. It's in Baltimore if you would like to come in July. We always have it at the hottest time of the year. Um, so these students, if you were to come to Artscape this summer, you would see the mini golf course that these students designed. And they went through a design process with some engineers, which took a lot of flexible thinking. Okay, so everyone wants resources. Everyone wants lots of stuff that they can walk away with. So what we have here are three different Padlets. One is for elementary school, one is for middle school, and one's for high school. There is also a uh, PDF with um, clickable links um, that will work with a screen reader because Padlet, I don't know if you guys realize this, Padlet does not work with a screen reader. So while I uh, love working with Padlet myself, it is not accessible to some of my colleagues. And so there's the PDF that can be found in the SCED. So we've got the links and the SCED. Also, as you guys ask me questions um, during the session or later on, I'm going to compile all of those. And if there are any additional resource resources that, I, that you guys want, um, I will put that on the SCED too, so you can access it all in one place. Um, and I'll answer any of those questions on Twitter too. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. So I think you, you brought up a good, they're practiced, right? So practice, executive function skills are used when things are not automatic. Um, and so some of those things the kids are doing with automaticity, some of those kids have been cooking in, with their parents or other caregivers since they were very, very young. And so they don't have to think, what is the proper way to crack an egg? They're just like, crack the egg. And we go. Um, they do. So I would... I would say that those kids, editing. Yeah. there's editing, <laughs> editing, the editing is there so that you feel like all of your students are failing at life, so, right? so those, those, stu those kids that are performing in that way, first of all, they must deal with anxiety very well because they're under a lot of pressure, so they must, they must have great coping skills and strategies. Um, they've got a lot of practice skills, and then they probably just have really great executive function skills, which some kids have because of variability, right? So some kids just have great executive function skills, but what we wind up doing in our classrooms is comparing that, that kid that's on the one end of the spectrum to everyone else. We'll be like, well, Shelby gets it. Shelby can sit there for 30 minutes while I read to my kindergarten class. Why don't you guys all get it together? Um, so there's another piece to think about too is that there's a gender difference on average and then we have kids that are old or young for grade um, and when kids are in elementary school especially those months matter so if you're in your classroom comparing an old for grade girl to a young for grade boy you could be talking about like two years of developmental difference between them so compare like thinking about the students all together you have to really keep in mind that you have all this variability and so we need to plan for it a lot more yes Uh, not specifically, but if you look at the high school one, they're clustered with adolescents, and you should have more expectations for the, the college students, but a lot of that you can pull in for them too. For them, it's going to be a lot of the higher level, like, do you know how to organize yourself? Do you know how to set proper goals? Um, but some of them, like if you have students that, in higher ed that are struggling with if ADHD, they might need additional support since so you have to have conversations with them about what do you need. So in college, I was my husband's executive function support, right? I like made sure he got to class on time. Most of the time, sometimes he went sailing instead. Um, and I would remind him when things were due. And it was definitely like a Hermione Ron relationship, right? I'm just like, this is what you need to do. So sometimes we just need to find coping strategies that work for him 
being married to me seems to be working out pretty well. But other people find other things and there's other tools and other supports. So we need to have conversations with kids like, what do you need to do to be an expert learner? Do you need help with executive function? If you do, here are the things you can do. So there's a website called understood.org and they have some information about executive function for, for older students. Yes. Yes. Oh, I haven't heard that term. Uh huh. Right. So the research is still emerging, and the way that um, research works, like one study does not prove something, right? So I can't tell you concretely that things are, are going to. I can tell you that because working memory requires practice and consistency with practicing skills, that the fact that I Google everything is probably not great for my working memory. The fact that the only phone number I have memorized is my own is probably not great. Um, so I can tell you that there's probably a practice effect going on where we're definitely farming a lot of things out and so we're not practicing. Now we could deal with that by practicing. Um, like I could make it a point of memorizing a few more phone numbers and trying to use them instead of my phone. Um, but in terms of like, are we totally changing our brains because of technology? I don't think there's enough evidence there yet. Um, but my personal research for my dissertation is going to be on whether or not all these tech tools is actually a, an executive function burden on students, right? So if, I, if you have trouble with inhibition control and I hand you a laptop, you now, in addition to all the other things you're inhibiting, need to inhibit not going on Facebook or looking at cat memes or Snapchatting, like all these different things. So I'm adding burdens of executive function onto you. At least that's my hypothesis. I don't know yet. I'll let you know. Um, and so if we don't support those things, are we causing more executive dysfunction? So we've, have we made the context so demanding that their skills aren't matching? And I know that sometimes I make my own context so demanding because I'm just like, well, what did BuzzFeed say about the sorting hat this week? Because there's always a new quiz. And I'm like, I should be writing something. What am I doing? <laughs> yes. So in terms of intervention or in terms of like supporting the executive function skills they need for that? Yeah, a middle school can work on both at once. And um, executive function influences math ability and language ability. Um, so like thinking about math, you have to have automatic information, but you also have to manipulate things in mind. You have to keep facts in mind. You have to keep rules in mind. You have to realize when the operational sign has changed and switched on you. Um, so there's a lot of executive function that um, has to do with math. Um, so if you create scaffolding for them and then slowly move the scaffolding away, that's really helpful. Another thing to know about math is that our, while our brains are not pre-designed for reading, they're pre-designed for language and then we re-recruit our language systems to, to read right, which is why some people have trouble with that, and then we call it dyslexia. Our brains are pretty predisposed to math skills, so, but they're three-dimensional in nature. So our brains like to think about math in 3D, and if we're using a lot of virtual manipulatives and a lot of like two, you know, just things on worksheets and we're not physically manipulating things, we're missing out on some of those executive function skills and math skills that we could be activating. So especially for younger kids, don't miss out on that 3D space stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, so ex teaching is hard, right? And we have to use our flexible thinking skills when we teach someone a skill that we might, it might already be an automatic skill for us, but now I have to take perspective and I have to think about, well, what do you need to learn and where are your barriers? And I need to think more deeply about the reading strategies in order to teach you. And so what they found was that the sixth graders were actually making a lot of gains, especially the sixth graders who had been struggling with some of, some of their skills at going back, having the confidence of having younger kids to teach, but then also going through that teaching process was really helping them. Yes.
Uh, it's in the SCED. So the, the online schedule, it's in there. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, it didn't pop up underneath. Okay. Okay. So if, if anyone needs assistance with that after this session, we can move out there and we can look at your laptop. Any other questions? Yes, I can support. I can support you. Do not become anxious. There is help on the way. We will all find our tools and resources. Um, thank you guys so much for participating and asking Cyborg's questions. Um, thank you for letting me be the biggest nerd ever today. <laughs>